Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Area Center webinar series, sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center, and I will be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar, Monitoring Marine Sanctuary Usage with NSM Count, NMS Count, presented by Dr. Robert Burns and Dr. Ross Andrew. Dr. Robert C. Burns is Director of the Division of Forestry and Natural Resources at West Virginia University and a former career military officer. Since 2016, Dr. Burns has led nearly 50 faculty, instructors, and adjunct faculty in 600 students across five academic programs, forestry resources management, wood science technology, energy land management, wildlife and fishery resources, and recreation, parks, and tourism. Dr. Burns' current research efforts focus on land and water uses with funding from U.S. federal agencies such as the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, National Science Foundation, EPSCOR, U.S. Forest Service, and the National Institute for National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Dr. Burns is responsible for developing a systematic data collection effort that allows managers to better understand the visitors to marine resource areas managed by NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, which we'll hear more about today. Dr. Ross Street Andrew is a postdoctoral research associate at West Virginia University in the Division of Forestry and Natural Resources. He has over a decade of experience working with natural resource management, research, and education. He has worked with, with many federal agencies, including NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wa U.S. Forest Service, USGS, and state DNRs, and universities alike during this period to conduct high-level research and monitoring programs. He has, he has helped develop and operate both theoretical and applied resource management programs in terrestrial and aquatic settings, and has an expanding interest in human dimensions of protected area management. Dr. Andrew helped create and implement the NMS count process and two national marine sanctuaries and looks forward to expanding the capabilities of the process in the coming years. We're very excited to have them both here today. Before I turn it over to Dr. Burns, I'd like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your questions into the question box, which is on your control panel, and we'll pose the questions to Drs. Doctors Burns and Andrew at the end of the presentation. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Burns. Okay, thank you, Zach, and uh, we really uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I think we have an exciting talk uh, because research is an exciting exciting process for us. Uh, before I get started, I want to just say a special thanks to Danielle Schwartzman and, and Mitchell Tart for their leadership over the past three years as we've evolved from having discussions about maybe doing this to completion. Um, thank our team of graduate students uh, who are, have done an amazing job of uh, collecting data for us over the past year and a half. And Dr. Bob Leeworthy, uh, who's the retired uh, former National Marine Sanctuary Chief Economist. Um, but primarily, I want to introduce to you uh, Ross, Dr. Ross Andrew, who's an expert in fishery science and a scholar in human dimensions. And he is the, uh, the young man who uh, will be leaving West Virginia University in a year or so, uh, hopefully in, a, uh, in an amazing position. So Dr. Andrews, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, this is it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon or this morning, wherever you might be. Um, and as Dr. Burns said, we're happy to present um, some work that we've been doing uh, in cooperation with all the partners you see here and, and you'll continue to see throughout over the last couple of years. And I just want to say this has truly been a, a success in collaboration and in what interdisciplinary teams can accomplish. Um, We've been working with agencies, both federal and state, universities, students across multiple levels, um, and then other organizations, uh, private and public as well. So we're happy to present this and, and welcome any feedback or questions at the end. So we're talking about National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, National Marine Sanctuaries, the office of NOAA National Marine Sanctuaries is the trustee of a network of 14 protected areas that basically serves to protect these natural and cultural resources in these aquatic protected area settings. Um, as the trustee, they, they conduct operations and, and research that cut across several different realms, um, one of them being conservation, um, directed by the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, which gives uh, regulatory authority and helps develop policy at these locations. Um, they conduct research and monitoring. They conduct a lot of educational and outreach operations, as well as community engagement. And as we talk today about our process, um, several of these 
domains will become apparent, how they interact, and how our process hopefully benefits each of them. As I said before, the National Marine Sanctuary System is shown here on this map. There are 14 National Marine Sanctuaries um, indicated by the circles. There are two Marine National Monuments and there are two uh, proposed National Marine Sanctuaries currently within the system. Something that's important to note here uh, related to the community involvement and community engagement is that those two proposed sanctuaries, uh, they don't just pop up overnight, they actually occur through a community nomination process. So everything we talk about here, we wanna keep in mind uh, the big picture, the broader impacts. It's not just what's going on in and underneath the water, it's also what's going on beyond the scope of the sanctuary themselves. So the, the project is directed by uh, a large challenge, and that challenge is understanding sanctuary use. Um, Sanctuaries are usually out in open water. Sometimes they're along the coast, uh, but every single sanctuary is unique in its attributes, its settings, um, and the way that people may access it. Uh, unlike something like a national park, where you might be entering through a gate or a road, or even be walking on a trail, it's fairly easy to understand where people are coming and going. Marine sanctuaries are very different. You have a lot of diversity in terms of the way people may access them. You also have a lot of temporal variability across where people might be using them. Um, and all this goes into the challenge to understand the best way to conduct sampling for use monitoring. Designing these studies is not easy to do or, or necessarily always cost effective, but that is our charge with this project to address this challenge. As you can see here, we have an example of Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary uh, offshore of coastal Georgia. It's the red box there out in the Atlantic Ocean, about 22 miles offshore. And just for the sake of um, this demonstration, you can see there are a lot of different hypothetical entry points. People can leave from lots of different places in a boat and travel through many different pathways to get to this marine sanctuary. So for us to be able to understand and monitor sanctuary use is a great challenge. So to address that challenge, we came up with uh, an overarching goal to create a reliable and valid process uh, for sanctuary use counting of people uh, within these contexts. And because all of them are different, um, this sort of takes on four different objectives. The first one being to understand the setting, the attributes of a particular sanctuary, uh, and the best practices or best methods that are available uh, to understand use at that sanctuary. Second objective, really look at the context uh, of that setting and talk to people that work there. These could be people that work in NOAA marine sanctuaries. It could be people that work in a private industry that run operations, charter boat captains, things like that. Try to understand the context of what might be feasible or not feasible based off of their input. Objective three is to really then develop a site-specific set of methods and a plan to address that at the site level. And then objective four is to actually conduct uh, the field study or data collection, analyze that, and see what we can find. Our process is shown here conceptually across those four phases. Uh, we've named them for uh, the purposes of understanding what they really are trying to accomplish in each phase. Phase one is sort of the discovery phase. This is where we try to understand what methods uh, exist. We try to understand the context of that sanctuary and understand the uniqueness that makes that sanctuary uh, its own. Phase two is the development phase. We talked about that, uh, I just talked about that as it addresses objective two. This is the development phase where we talk to local experts, get their input, and then design uh, methodologies that would address those strengths and limitations at each site. The third phase is the, is the design phase. This is where we lay all of our methods out on the table and we see what could work given sampling, uh, 
feasibility for costs, logistics, things like that. And then the fourth phase is the determine phase where we actually determine what sanctuary use is happening and we get our data and we do our analysis. So with that overview, let's now walk or, or swim. Uh, forgive the, the sanctuary joke. We'll swim through our phases in a little more detail. So phase one, the discovery phase. Uh, this typically involves a, an extensive literature review. And this is what we did for this process over the last couple of years, looking at hundreds of uh, previous research studies, uh, white papers, technical reports and memos, trying to understand what is possible uh, at different sites. And this is sort of what some of the output looks like. We've been able to publish our process uh, through peer reviewed journals, understanding that you know, the application of previous literature and previous research is important to what we're doing now. And then also inventorying site attributes. You can see there in that small table, example table on the right, looking at a setting and actually seeing what the primary uses are, key habitat types, things like that. For this pilot study, we had two marine sanctuaries that we were working on. The first is Gray's Reef, established in 1981. And the second is Florida Keys, established in 1975. This is an example of how we might have a product or an output from phase one, understanding what the key habitat types are, understanding what important species or communities are, as well as uh, conservation threats, the status of those threats, and then lastly but not least, primary uses. Um, it's important for us to understand this because like I said earlier, every sanctuary is so unique. Without this baseline understanding, we're going to go in somewhere and we're going to uh, potentially look at something that is not really applicable. Phase two or the development phase. Uh, I should note here in these photos, these were taken in 2019 before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's why we're present here with folks without masks. But Phase two, the development phase, really involves talking to people. And sitting down, you can see here on the upper right, we're with folks around Gray's Reef, and on the, the left, we're with people in the Florida Keys. And we're talking for the majority of a day uh, about sources of data, uh, potential methods that would be uh, feasible at that site, and then also evaluating these people with local expert knowledge about that sanctuary we're evaluating their level of confidence with each type of method. Generally, we find these people uh, have a lot of ideas about potential data sources and understanding of what is already possible, but they also don't have a ton of confidence in terms of what those data can actually do for use monitoring. From there, we go to phase three, and this is our design phase. So, we take all of our input that we get from our expert panel through phase two, all the information we gathered foundationally through phase one, and we come up with a sampling strategy that's appropriate to that specific context. This is going to include things like the type of methods that are uh, available, the cost of those methods, the accessibility of those methods. Uh, you can see here we have some quick examples starting on the left, satellite imagery, where you can highlight vessels fairly easily, shown in the circles there that are highlighted, uh, where you can count vessels within an area quite quickly. Um, if you want to zoom in and get a little closer, you can do aerial surveys for counts of vessels or people through airplanes or helicopters. Um, we can have people on the ground, students or other field personnel that are at important locations where people might be coming and going out of a sanctuary or into a sanctuary and intercepting them to get counts as well as other survey data. Or you can go back to remote methods on the right, and look at things like AIS uh, data, which is uh, used for vessel safety tracking, things like that, uh, and, and understand where vessels have been and, and are going. Once we have those methods on the table, we want to look at them in the context of what's feasible once again. We separate this out conceptually based off of um, existing data and then new data that we can provide through our process. Now, existing data on the left, things like satellite imagery, buoy cameras, patrol data, uh, and acoustics, 
might be um, readily available and people at that sanctuary might be already aware of that. Uh, our new data that we want to collect through our process uh, centers off of surveys or we can basically supplement uh, an under our understanding of what use is based off of people's responses, but as well as looking at other data that we're calling new here, even though it's already existing. Things like social media, AIS, those are already existing, but we're calling them new data and sources because they might not have necessarily been tapped into for this type of application. What we hope to do then is blend those two first two columns together to create some sort of synthesized output that gives us a picture of what user counts are and what user definitions are. So the number of people and then some information about those people. We'll look at an example here moving forward and we'll use Florida Keys as an example. As we go through phase four, we look at things that are available or not available. Um, sometimes uh, a setting or a site does not have um, a data source available. And so, you know, for the simple example here, we're going to say that some things are not available or some things are available. And we'll, we'll go ahead and take a deeper dive into a couple of these. So there we go, we'll take a deeper dive. We have to show a diving slide. So using Florida Keys as an example, if you look at the right, you can see our area of interest is the upper Florida Keys, just south of Miami, going down to the lower part of Isla Mirada, lower Metacombe Key. That's outlined in the red or orange dotted line. And we're looking at satellite imagery here. We have to say thank you to our partners at NOAA and at USGS for allowing us access to some of these, these data and these images. Um, but with each potential method, we have to look at this in terms of its value and its utility. Um, when you look at a satellite image, it's very clear to see what vessels are present, where they are. You can even measure that. However, we know satellite images are not collected 24 seven. We also know that they don't cover every single square inch of a sanctuary. So in this uh, particular example, we have to determine uh, where our images are covering spatially, as well as when they're available temporally. Once again, if you look at the, the left side there, you can see a panchromatic image that shows vessels marked with X's. The ones on the left that are red are docked. The ones on the right are out underway, moving or stationary, but away from the dock. These images provide a lot of information, assuming we have adequate coverage. So for Florida Keys, for the upper Florida Keys, I want to just demonstrate uh, what satellites were available to us. We used Worldview 1, 2, and 3 whenever there were scenes available and whatever area of coverage we could use. Now, as I said before, sometimes you're going to be able to cover all of your sanctuary or your protected area with an image. Other times you're only going to cover a portion of that. So within our satellite imagery analysis for upper Florida Keys, we only have some of the area covered. But what's important about this is that we can still calculate vessel density uh, within our area of coverage, and then we can use those density numbers to actually demonstrate um, areas of, of high and low use uh, in and outside of our, our coverage. So. so here's an example of that. This represents a kernel density estimator. Uh, on the left, you see 2019, and on the right, you see 2020 within our area of interest, upper Florida Keys. Uh, it's basically a heat map in terms of the scale. You see uh, warmer colors like red and orange and yellow indicating more vessel density, and those cooler colors like blue indicating low vessel density. This is including all vessels that were shown in our images. And as you can see here, there's a lot of uh, high density sort of bias towards the land. And that means that we're picking up a lot of docked vessels. And that's okay, but we can separate those out further. And we can say, now we'll remove all of the docked vessels. And in this set of images, the scales have changed in terms of the density. But you can see now that we're looking at vessels that are underway, either moving or stationary away from the dock, and where they are. 
Uh, and this helps us understand, A, the, the amount of vessels at that given time and location, but also potentially informative in, uh, information about where these hotspots might be occurring within a sanctuary. Another data source that we want to go into a little bit of detail with here is AIS data. AIS stands for Automated Information System. Uh, we have to give thanks to partners from NOAA once again for allowing us to have access to the U.S. Coast Guard Navigation Center who provides this data. Uh, these data are required on large vessels um, and optional on smaller vessels. Uh, basically, if you have a, a vessel over 65 feet in length or you're a commercial vessel, a passenger vessel, uh, you're required to have AIS for safety. This is a communication device that uses radar uh, to indicate positions. We were able to get data from the Coast Guard Nav Center and we we're able to look within our area of interest over a long time period, going all the way back to the end of 2018, looking until last summer. Uh, we summarized this data across months for the total number of vessels. You can see there's a lot of vessel detections here, uh, 57,000 plus. This is also nice to see temporally because you see there are some fairly higher or lower uh, seasons, you might call them, where there are more or less vessels uh, being detected with this method. AIS data is nice because it has excellent temporal coverage but it also contains information about that vessel. So it contains information about the size of the vessel, uh, what type of vessel it is in terms of a cargo ship versus a sailboat versus a pleasure craft. And then we can summarize that along with things like the vessel size or the length. You can see here across that same time period, the yellow bars indicate the percentage of our AIS signal vessels that were pleasure craft. And we're interested in that because that is a type of marine sanctuary use um, where we want to uh, understand what, where people are going and what they're doing. Um, so we can look at this type of data and actually make some pretty nice inferences about what's going on. The way we do that is we think back to our original conceptual diagram. We're now synthesizing AIS data with our survey data. So we conducted surveys and we collected a lot of information from people about their activity when they're um, pleasure boating, the number of people that they're with, uh, and then also typical trip expenditures. And if you use an example here, we go from a fairly high use season of March 2019 to a fairly low use season of October 2019. We can uh, subset this data set of AIS and look at the percentage of pleasure craft change seen from March to October 2019 represents around a 60% decrease in the number of people. And looking at the approximate number of people and expenditures related to that, we get a decrease in economic contribution of those pleasure boaters somewhere between one and three million dollars. Now that's based off of whether or not we're using a conservative estimate for the number of people or an aggressive estimate based off of our survey data, vessel size, things like that. But this is an example of how you can blend data sources that are existing with additional data that we are collecting in our process to produce something uh, beyond just the number of votes. Something else we wanna do with all of our methods is compare them against one another. We wanna make sure that there's value and utility in all of our methods, and we want to make sure that we understand the limitations of them against each other. So we did compare, uh, we have an example here where we compared satellite and AIS data for this upper Florida Keys area, and understanding that AIS data are collected continuously through time, but satellite images are only collected when that satellite is over top of your area of interest. Uh, we wanted to compare using uh, a fair comparison. So we held time constant from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we looked at the total number of vessels detected. AIS is uh, typically only signaled when that vessel is underway, either moving or anchored. And 
Within satellite images, we saw before you can detect a lot of vessels that are docked as well as moving. So we saw 91 vessels on AIS at that time period and that day. We saw just over 1,900 total vessels in satellite imagery. Of those 1,900, 322 were undocked or underway. Therefore, we can say, based off of this particular example, AIS is capturing about 28% of those vessels that are undocked within our area of interest. So that's really important for us to um, know because like I said before, not every vessel has AIS or is required to have uh, that aboard. Here's a, another look at that. Um, if you look on the left side, you see vessels from AIS. There's only two that were uh, there near the dock, perhaps just getting underway. And then you have about 40 on the other side, uh, identified through our classification with satellite imagery uh, that we can see very clearly of uh, that same time period and same uh, area. Okay, the last uh, detailed method we'll talk about in this little case study example is social media. Uh, most people are familiar with social media. You can see over here on the right, this is a, a screenshot of a page that we might have used for our data collection here. Uh, we've made this a happy snorkeling group to protect identities and uh, canceled out names. But what we did with this type of data collection was we looked at public profiles, public posts that were associated with a particular area within our sanctuary. And for the upper Florida Keys, this is nice because um, it's very easy to see where people are, are putting things and hashtagging molasses reef, hashtagging Florida and Key Largo. So it makes it a little bit easier for us to go through and uh, look at public pages and sort of quantify this information. Once again, uh, this is a, an example of how we combined that social media data collection with uh, information that we derived from our surveys. We asked people, what percentage of the time do you post on social media when you make a trip for ocean recreation? We can stratify that by group, people that say they're primarily divers versus people that are primarily uh, snorkeling or general boating, et cetera. They have different posting rates on average. And then we do simple math, using that frequency of posting, the number of posts per group category that we found divided by that frequency gives us an estimate of the number of visits stratified by group type. This is clearly a snorkeling group. As you can see, they have little snorkels there uh, sticking out from their smiling faces. It's also important to note here that social media posts across our area of interest, uh, they're going to differ and not necessarily be distributed evenly. This is due to the diversity of habitats that are present within these some of these marine sanctuaries. You can see here each site that we were able to get social media data from is represented as a circle and different colors within that circle represent the percentage of posts that are related to a different activity. Things that are totally or almost totally blue are mostly posts about diving. It means that site is well uh, visited or well used by divers. There are other sites that are kind of a mix of colors here, and you can see that means they're sort of a mix of uses. Now I wanna do one more example here of how we can use this information. So let's call out Molasses Reef, where our snorkelers were um, enjoying themselves earlier. Looking at Molasses Reef, we have a simple estimate of visits on the y-axis across each month of the year 2019. This is stratified by different use types, and this is representing only social media data. So it's important to note here that you can see there are different uh, areas of high and low use, and then also there are different uh, times of the year where you have uh, more or less activity based off of each uh, type of use. If we are to sort of sum this up, we can get an annual estimate of visits across these different user types. Why this is important is because we asked within our surveys what different user types typically have in terms of group size, as well as expenditures for a single trip of that activity type. Based off of this, 
We can estimate just using social media data for Molasses Reef in 2019, there are approximately 522 visits, uh, which represents just over 1,800 people and around $275,000 of economic contribution based off of the amount of money that people spend to go diving versus snorkeling, et cetera. None of this would be possible without our survey effort. We were planning on doing um, some intercept surveys. Obviously the pandemic sort of messed up some of those sampling plans. We did a 100% online uh, survey effort where we emailed people. Uh, we were able to get over 2,400 completed responses of those people that we were able to contact effectively. So we do feel good about our survey effort, even though it was um, totally remote. Within our surveys, uh, the types of data that we uh, collected were use frequency, things like the number of days and types of activities, uh, the group size stratified by activity. As you saw earlier, we know that snorkelers and divers might have different numbers of people than uh, a group of fishermen going out. And we asked about use duration, season, and motivations. Uh, we, of course, we asked about demographics like a census would, as well as location of users, home location. We asked about factors that might influence use, things like the weather or the time of year. Um, we also asked about the locations of use and the economics of their use. Here's an example of a question that a survey respondent might see where we ask them to click on a map where is the most commonly um, used location when you're in the Upper Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And based off of the number of responses, we can generate this sort of uh, heat map that we can then further quantify uh, looking at a grid and see the number of responses or the number of clicks that were present in each area. And we can see that based off of this particular survey response, uh, we know about 23% uh, are, are focusing their use around Isla Morada, maybe 14% around Alligator Reef, 7% around Molasses Reef, which we talked about earlier with social media, and 5% up at Carysport. This type of information can then be coupled with some of these other methods that we talked about um, to, to sort of help ground truth what people are saying versus where we're actually seeing vessels and where we're seeing uh, people. Additionally, the economics by strata. So sort of talked about this in earlier reference, but the activity types, whether you're fishing, diving, et cetera, uh, expenditure types, so stratified by spending money on food versus lodging versus fuel, uh, location of expenditures. Are you staying in Key Largo, but you're going fishing in Isla Morada? Okay, there's differences in where you're spending money. And then of course, using all of that, we can combine and get typical trip expenditures of around $1,700 uh, for our average uh, user here in this particular example. So at this point, uh, we just wanna recap to make sure that uh, people understand this is, uh, for the sake of time, a sort of quick uh, skim over uh, some of the potential methods and some of the outputs and ways that our process is useful. Um, moving forward, we're continuing to uh, finalize all of our overall estimates for sanctuary use at our two pilot study sites, Gray's Reef and Florida Keys, and understanding those related expenditures. Uh, currently, we're Continuing, we're planning to continue to identify strengths and limitations of our methods, um, especially because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to make sure that what we were doing remotely uh, would still be applicable if we were able to be there in person, uh, intercepting people, going up in an airplane or a helicopter to look at actual counts to verify what we see in other methods. We also wanna um, make sure that what we're doing allows interaction with other programs and processes that are being developed. NOAA is, has a sanctuary use characterization assessment and research program, also known as SUCAR, that is uh, getting off the ground now. And we wanna make sure that the lessons that we've learned through our pilot studies 
are able to be fed into that process so that they don't have to make any mistakes that we've already made. Um, and then we also wanna leverage our current work for developing additional capacity, engaging with other groups, um, and then applying this to other sanctuaries, protected areas, um, and disciplines. Uh, we're really happy to be able to share some of this information with you all today. Um, the Skimmer, the National MPA Center, we wanna say thank you for giving us this platform to demonstrate a quick example of what our process can do. Um, and then we also, you know, we'll continue to try to publish things in peer reviewed journal articles, open access areas, so that people can understand what we've done and hopefully build off of it. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. I do wanna take a minute to say thank you um, to our pilot study site partners, Gray's Reef and Florida Keys. They've been very helpful the whole way, uh, meeting with us, talking with us, doing check-ins. Um, and I, I wanna also say uh, thanks to Matt Kendall and the INCOS group, which is National Center for Coastal Ocean Science. They did a concurrent study at Gray's Reef um, that looked at a lot of similar things to what we've been doing. Uh, and we've been in communication with them and as well as the folks at Gray's Reef to see where uh, we can add additional value. So one of those ways might be our surveys, helping to give even more detailed information beyond uh, what is available in just with counts. So uh, there are links to more information here and we're always happy to uh, chat further, you can always contact us. So I'll stop there. I think we've been 30 or 40 minutes and hopefully we have time for a little question. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, excellent job of presenting. And what Ross presented uh, was really, he demonstrated the, the need to access um, multiple methods. I uh, kind of call it a, a, a quilt of many colors or a, a braided basket scenario where one of these supports the other. Uh, so AIS data complements the satellite data. The satellite data correlates with the survey data. So all these pieces are needed. Um, and, and one other piece that really didn't come out clear today is the importance of a strong analysis team. We have experts at West Virginia University that are working on specifically on the satellite data, specifically on the social media data. Uh, so that, that piece is very important. Um, we will have a final report uh, to Danielle Schwartzman at the uh, end of this month. I'm sure she'll be able to share that with you all once that's uh, finalized. And we will continue to seek opportunities to uh, to replicate and extend our data. Um, we understand that th these sites are very site specific um, and there may be methods that are uh, of data collecting ongoing in other sites that can contribute to our, our overall uh, methodology. Our overall goal, as I finalize my last few words here, is to develop a low cost method of estimating usage, both, both visitors and those who may live in the communities within the National Marine Sanctuary uh, for NMS settings uh, nationwide. With that, I'll turn it back over to Zach and, and thank you all. Thank you both for such a great presentation. So we definitely do have some questions that have already rolled in and we have plenty of time to answer questions. So if you do have questions for Dr. Andrew or Dr. Burns, please put them in the question box and I will make sure to get to as many as possible. So the first I want to do is we have a question asking if you would be able to post the links that you have on this slide here onto the chat, which would make them uh, accessible to everyone. So if either of you have the ability to do that, that would be, be fantastic so that people can go ahead and get at those those resources. Sure, I should be able to do that. I'll stop uh, sharing the screen here and I'll copy and paste them in in just a second. Thanks. Great. Uh, first question we have is how did the user located use maps compare with other sensing methods and were there any discrepancies that stood out? Um, so our user located maps where they responded on the actual survey themselves, um, those have not been quantified directly in comparison to all of the um, things such as satellite imagery um, yet. So that's something that's still coming down the pipeline. We, we gave the example of comparing methods from AIS to satellite imagery. 
Um, but we've yet to uh, do all of those comparisons. As we said before, uh, you're catching us maybe a month before uh, we have all of our final results compiled in a report. Um, but one thing that is uh, important, an important distinction to understand there is that we're asking people to click on a map to the place that they most commonly visit. Um, and this gets to the Florida Keys as an example. Um, you can visit the Florida Keys and uh, be on land in a restaurant and click on that particular location on the map, and it might have nothing to do with being out in the sanctuary. Uh, at Gray's Reef, that's not possible. If you're in the Gray's Reef sanctuary, you're out on a boat or you're in the water. Um, so this kind of gets at uh, the context dependency of each of these sites. Uh, and so that's something that we're going to have to try to tease out as we go forward the next month or so. But thanks. Great, thanks. Um, we have someone who's asked, assuming fishers fish and divers dive where there's habitat that uh, where there's habitat and that Florida Keys isn't homogenous, was benthic habitat data included in the density estimator calculations? Sorry, I'm still trying to copy and paste those links into the chat. Yeah, let, but, let's come uh, back to those links a, a little later. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, no um, yeah, so we have that information, but it is not incorporated into the, the density estimators yet. Uh, currently, the density estimators are just using uh, the actual location of vessels or people where they indicated they were or where we saw them through AIS or satellite imagery. Um, but this is a research process and, and we are academic researchers. So as we move forward, uh, we do have plans to do additional analysis beyond the scope of just sanctuary use to try to get some interesting uh, research outputs to, to look at those types of correlations. We'll do some additional spatial modeling where we can incorporate those as a, as a factor, certainly. Um, and then the other thing we wanna do is we wanna do some, some modeling um, similar to what um, the NCOS group did at Gray's Reef, but looking at motivations. Um, so I'm trying to understand if, if fishers fish and divers dive, uh, what motivates them to be at one place versus another, um, and, and what days of the year, what conditions, uh, things like that that sort of pop out in those analysis. So yeah, we don't have that analysis complete, but it'll certainly be incorporated and hopefully be you know, published in a journal in the future. Great, thank you. We have two questions asking about automation in your data, so I'm going to ask them both at the same time. First asked whether or not you used artificial intelligence application to automatically capture and process data from social media or whether or not you did that manually. And the other asks, um, in the study, how did you count the boats in the satellite imagery? Did you do that manually or did you explore automated options? Okay, yeah, those are, those are both excellent questions of the same vein. Um, we explored automated options for both of those. Uh, for this potential, for this pilot study, we actually conducted both manually um, because we had uh, a fairly small sample size of satellite imagery available. Um, we were able to work through them with a team of researchers and students here uh, at our university uh, fairly easily. I will say that the satellite imagery that we got uh, was pretty high resolution. It was uh, sub meter pixel size. So looking at those, there were panchromatic images. There is very easy to identify vessels. Um, and based off of the number of images and scenes that we had, we did that manually. However, we do have the capacity to use software such as eCognition. Um, to create classifications that are trained into machine learning processes that could hopefully then automate this process over larger areas or larger sets of images. Uh, we did not do that for this pilot study for a couple reasons, uh, cost, time, uh, and the, the relatively low number of images available. So that's the satellite image part. The social media part uh, is also similar in that we used uh, manual uh, public page scraping. So we were able to go on to social media sites and any public profile, we were able to scrape information from those uh, 
based off of their location, their activity, uh, the nature of the post. We did explore using things such as uh, APIs that are available from, for different platforms, uh, but there's some limitation there because not all social media platforms allow public access to their APIs, or uh, they might charge money to access those. Um, and we did explore that. I think we, we explored that with Twitter uh, and Flickr, which are fairly well-known APIs for extracting this type of data. Um, but when it came down to it, it was uh, easier for us in this uh, pilot study to uh, look at these manually. And we were fortunate because we did have a, a large team here and we were able to have some students work through a lot of these pages and quantify you know, thousands of social media posts um, in that sense. Moving forward, we're, we're definitely open to uh, expanding these, but this is something that you know, is new to our process to look at sanctuary use through these types of data. And we think, once again, we have the capacity to develop those, those sets of code and those programs, but we may need some additional support through uh, computer science, things like that. Right, and I would also add uh, that we're developing a proposal now to the National Science Foundation for uh, the 2021 convergent grant process, which will allow us to test uh, AI uh, methodology in understanding these big data points. Great, thanks. And I guess possibly building off URL's answers to that question, have you looked at using AIS data kinematics to determine what the vessels are doing? such as trolling, traveling, or sailing? We know that the capacity, there is capability there, but for this study, um, that was not part of what we were doing, but there, there are a myriad of, of other possibilities, and, and we would definitely appreciate uh, being able to capture these questions uh, through the, uh, the chat system later, uh, because there's some really good, good points coming up. That information is certainly valuable and, and usable within AIS. That's one of the things about AIS that, that we're learning to love. Uh, we joke that nobody cared about AIS data until a ship blocked the Suez Canal a few weeks ago. And then everybody was looking at marinetraffic.com or whatever. Um, but that those data are quite rich in that they, under, they have things like vessel speed and orientation. So uh, we definitely have the, the data sets to do that. We'll, just haven't yet. Great, thank you. Uh, next question asks, how did you assign AIS records to vessel categories? And did you consider time spent in the sanctuary or simply counts? They also ask, did you do or do you plan on doing any modeling or complementary research to estimate or account for boats that may have been missed and not counted? So, I don't know if I really got the first part of that question. Um, yeah, sorry. It's, it's a three-part question. The first asks how you assigned AIS records to determine vessel categories. Um, the second asks, did you consider time that they spent in the sanctuary and not just the counts? The third asks whether or not you're considering any kind of methodology modeling, statistical modeling, in order to try and account for boats that may have been missed um, in order to update your counts, as create a better estimate for the counts. Okay, so uh, yeah, the first part, I guess, how did we assign the vessel category? So uh, that is contained within the AIS uh, data order that we receive through the U.S. Coast Guard Nav Center. There's a there's metadata. There's a column that basically describes a, a category for that particular vessel and how it is classified in its registration for um, you know, the AIS system as it receives its locational information. All that is assigned just like it, you would a, a, the name of a vessel. So we just used the information that was contained within those records. Secondly, we did not yet quantify time in the sanctuary. That's something that AIS data um, is, once again, it's very rich in that uh, it produces signals uh, all the time within even just a, a matter of seconds uh, for, for safety reasons. 
But in our AIS data order, we received a five minute aggregate location for each vessel. So, you know, most vessels are not going to be moving so fast that you see them in five minutes and then they're out of the sanctuary, but it is possible. Um, so we did not necessarily quantify time spent there, but it would be quite simple to do within our data set because we have each vessel identification number or each vessel name. And then we have the, we could quantify the number of points across a five minute aggregate uh, time period to see the approximate number of minutes per day they were there. Um, but once again, I just wanna say, these data sets are quite rich, they're quite large. Um, so our priority initially for the pilot studies here were to simply quantify the, the number of those vessels, the, the use, and then all the additional information uh, will hopefully come out later. The last part of that question, I believe, was how do we validate our AIS locations versus other methods? Was that correct? The other question, the other part of the question, sorry, I probably shouldn't have asked three questions in one question, um, was whether or not you considered any kind of modeling technique or other statistical technique to account for the fact that you are not going to, probably not going to be able to see everything that gets in there. So um, some kind of validation for uh, correcting the number based off of vessel, the probability of number of vessels that you might have missed. Right. And so we we kind of touched close to that with the uh, comparison of the satellite imagery to the AIS, looking at the percentage that are captured. Um, that was just a, a quick example of looking at one potential uh, time period and, and location to compare two options against each other. But uh, we're open to doing that across all of these. Uh, thinking to another example of social media, uh, think about a social media post that might be present uh, from a small recreational boat that does not have AIS, and it was at a particular reef site uh, when there was no satellite overhead on that particular day or time. So seeing those types of potential gaps um, allows us to have the ability to hopefully hone in on where there are uh, agreements and disagreements, but we've yet to do that. But once again, yeah, we will and I just, just to add to that, that um, you know, our goal was to develop a sample, not a census of all use. Uh, we were funded at the level to, to look at uh, a sample uh, rather than the, uh, you know, doing a complete census. So we know that there are uh, a lot of other opportunities and, and we do value this question. Great, thank you. Um, I will say I found the number of different things that you all looked at very impressive and a good way to kind of cover your bases. And we have a question towards that end, noting that all different data collection uh, techniques have biases and some more than others. So how would you make the determination on which to favor more in a final estimate, noting that this is a, a test and not, not a full, cens full census? So part of that comes from our, our phases where we talk to the local expert panel and we develop those levels of confidence in methods. Um, and once again, it goes into, I like to think of it spatially and temporally. Uh, you have methods that are really, really good at capturing data across time, or you have methods that are really good at capturing data across space, uh, or you have methods that are that are doing that a little bit with both um, and I think the best way for us to move forward is to combine the level of confidence that our experts have which really gets at that site uh, specific context and then combine that with what we know about the methods and or each yep. data source and its bias and have some sort of intersection between confidence and then uh, data source bias. Yeah, and this is uh, really something that's that's highlighted in that uh, journal that, that's published, and I think we sent the link there, Journal of Ecotourism, about this methodology. Um, one of the key parts about this method is that, is the, as Ross mentioned, the importance of um, congruence from staff on at the site. We know at Gray's Reef, for example, there, there are hydrophones that are mounted to the seabed. That doesn't exist uh, in our area in Florida Keys. There's one smart buoy that has a camera in Gray's Reef, we can use that data 
Um, so it, it's more about um, what data is appropriate for which site. Uh, and we, we acknowledge that all, all data has uh, bias built into it. But at the, at the end of the day, I think the, um, what we're looking for is um, something that's acceptable uh, to managers at probably an 80% confidence level um, at a specific site. And then if everything goes as planned, we'll be able to determine after we uh, conduct this study across the 14, 15, or 16 National Marine Sanctuaries, what are those um, data methodologies that are common across all sites? And what are those that are specific to certain types of site uh, sites such as uh, ship graveyards versus uh, open ocean. Great, thanks. We have someone referencing the little bit of the economic numbers you all shared. They're wondering if you can determine who receives this usage revenues. Uh, you know, was it going to major corporations? Was it going to local um, local shops? Was there any kind of analysis as to how that money is being spent beyond just that the money is being spent? Well, I'll say that, that we are not economists, but we're lucky to be working with folks like Danielle, um, who, who is an economist, and they helped uh, sort of guide us in the development of our, our surveys and some of the questions that we ask. Um, we think that our, our strata are most relevant in determining um, total economic contribution for a potential area and, and across different strata. We do have questions in there where we ask about um, differences in the way expenditures might fall out for something like food, like food at a restaurant versus food at uh, a grocery store, or fuel that you purchase locally from a marina, or fuel that you uh, put into your car or your boat farther up to the interstate. Something like that uh, may have the potential to look at sort of the um, the sourcing or the, the movement of expenditures through the local community and economy. Um, but I would defer to a, a, an economist for, for more detail on that. Great, thanks. Um, we do have a related question asking, how did you measure total economic contribution? Yeah, and I think again, um, this is uh, Robert responding. I think we'll defer to uh, when this report is finished. Uh, we'll ask Danielle to to respond to those questions. Um, Danielle and her team. Great, thank you. So, uh, probably the final question here asks: In your final report, or do you have any plans to evaluate either the NOAA Coast Watch synthetic aperture radar data, which allows for vessel counts, or the Global Fishing Watch's data validated in collaboration with NOAA, and possibly comparing those to the data that you all gathered? So, okay, interesting question. Go ahead, Ross. Yeah, I'll just say uh, at this point. Uh, based off of our, our capacity for, you know, for our, our funding, our timeline for this, uh, we're pretty much done with uh, collecting new sources of data. However, uh, we're, this is an ongoing sort of living, breathing research process, so we're totally open to looking at additional sources. In our final report, we're not planning on bringing anything new in at this point. But once again, uh, the goal for this is to move beyond the pilot studies, take the lessons that we learned here for what works and what might not work, and see how we can build off of it. I mean, we want to, if there's a way to supplement the data that we're getting now uh, that makes something stronger, then we'll most certainly look to do that uh, as we go forward. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things that uh, a, a challenge as large as this, uh, you can really, you can really never stop, right? There's always another source of data that uh, you could cross-reference. Uh, and so we just, we wanna make sure that we're delivering yeah. something that's within the scope of what, you know, we originally promised and uh, we're open to that moving yeah. forward. And that's exactly uh, the great thing about the opportunity to speak here today is any of you who uh, identify other sources such as these, uh, the Coast Watch and Global Fish Watch, um, we're very happy to take that information down and, you know, perhaps we can use those methods in the next uh, survey that we uh, conduct for National Marine Sanctuaries. 
Great, thank you. We are at the end of our time. So I want to thank both Dr. Ross and Dr. Andrew and Dr. Burns um, for their presentation. We're getting lots of messages coming in saying that this is outstanding work that you guys have uh, done a great presentation. And there's obviously been a lot of discussion and a lot of, <clears throat> it stimulated a lot of thought into the process of visitor use and measuring visitor use. So I want to thank both of you and I want to thank all of our attendees today. That is the end of our webinar and I hope you all have a great day. Thank, thank you, you, Zach.